Hi, this is Paul. I want to follow up on the video that I released. Uh, today's Tuesday, so I released it on Tuesday. Jordan Peterson's Exodus Seminar and the Rewilding of Christianity. Now, I don't plan to use any clips from the Exodus Seminar in this video, but I think it's really important to set up what this seminar is and isn't about. One of the things that you won't hear in this seminar is a lot of talking about the historicity of Exodus. Now, there might be some of that coming um, in future videos in, from them, but I don't think so. And there's a reason for that. And it's actually connected with the reason why perhaps there isn't a biblical scholar on the group. Because most of modernist biblical scholarship for a couple of hundred years has been focusing on modernist concerns about the text. And part of what makes this conversation so interesting is that they are not focusing on those things. And which means we have to get into why these concerns are there. In my flippancy with the cosmic skeptic, I didn't fully treat this, but let's do it now. Notice the question he opens with. Terminology, an atheist. So does Peterson think that the events of the Bible are fictional? Or does he think that they really happened? Okay, right there. What is that question about? Okay, well, the question seems obvious. Another question might be, why does it matter to you? Well, let's take a listen. The Old Testament reports in the book of Exodus that the Jews were enslaved in Egypt before embarking on a journey through the wilderness after being liberated from their slavery. Moses is said to part the Red Sea during the escape, which he then drops on the Pharaoh and his soldiers, drowning all of them and facilitating the Jewish escape. Quite a specific series of events. So, Dr. Peterson, do you think that the events of Exodus actually happened, or are they just fiction? You might ask, well, did, did the events in Exodus really happen? And our conclusion was, well, not only did they, they happened in a, in a meta manner. They're still happening. And again, this is why I called him obtuse and why Grim Grizz called him pedantic, because this is, in fact, how we approach many type stories. Now, very quickly, a bunch of people will jump in to sort of um, fix, fix this by talking, using words like mythology, and it's not a bad word to use. Oh, see, I'm not even... Not even showing, oh, that's not what I want to show. That's not what I want to show. Oh, I got to get my act together here. Here we go. Now we got it right. Now we can see him up here on the screen. This issue, which if we, let's see if they, he, he's on to the Douglas. This is the, this is the Douglas Murray question, and it's a good question. And it has been the predominant question in the modern period. Now, we have to really be careful about pushing these questions too far. I get all my buttons confused. We have to really be questions about pushing these, concerned about pushing these questions too far because if we push them too far, which is often what we do, we might imagine that, well, ancient people didn't care about, let's call it physical correspondence. Of course they did. And right in the Gospel of John, famously now renamed Doubting Thomas, said, unless I put my fingers in his hand and my hand in his side, I won't believe he rose from the dead. In other words, ancient people understood physical correspondence with, with um, between words and situations in the physical world. Ancient people understood that. We understood that. How did ancient people relay ideas. That's a little trickier. And again, I'll often point to C.S. Lewis's section on the ascension in his book, Miracles. Because part of what is true is that, well, what Jordan Peterson just said there, well, let's just back it up a little bit here. Well, not only did they, they happened in a, in a meta manner, they're still happening. He's not wrong. We talk this way all the time, but what people want to focus on with a question like, 
Exodus is, did it really happen? Now, we might think, well, that's a simple question. Did a group of descendants of Jacob leave Egypt in the, um, in the, aft in the aftermath of a series of calamities that brought the Egyptian empire to their knees. Now, even just notice the way I say this. If I say it that way, and this has been done often to the story of Exodus, if I say it that way, you begin to say, well, maybe the situation, maybe these were natural disasters and not timed by God, uh, you know, an actor in the sky. Um, right away, things start going. Even if there isn't really much doubt about what happened physically, just take a look at how much debate there can be about the meaning of such a thing. Just simply look at, now I, I, I hate to say it because I know what it will trigger, but that's part of my point. What happened in January 6th? Well, there's plenty of video cameras, there's plenty of eyewitnesses, there's, there's plenty of everything about, and the real question is what it meant. This issue about the Bible and history is a very big deal and a very long one, and it's not something easily satisfied to our liking, partly because ancient people didn't work exactly like we do. Now, again, I want to be careful. I don't want to overreach that in saying, well, ancient people were just dupes. No, no, that's not true. Or ancient or we modern people are all about correspondence. No, we can't get on the page, same page about January 6th, even though there's, we're, there's not a lot of question about what happened physically on January 6th in the capital of the United States. It's a question of how do we present what's important? And again, back to all of the stuff we talk about in this little corner and the stuff that, in fact, Jordan Peterson talked about with Jonathan Peugeot and Doug Murray, which is where many of these clips come from the cosmic skeptic. It's a question of how do you select what is relevant? How do you select what to pay attention to? Now, again, cosmic skeptic sort of wanted to use a binary with respect to the Bible. Did things in the Bible really happen? Bad question. Why? Well, because what things? Because a good many things in the Bible, um, nobody doubts happened. Was King David a king of Israel? That's pretty much known today for a long time. People were skeptical about it. Let's take things off the, off the question of the Bible. Um, was there a war in Troy? Was Troy a real city? Oh, many for in the earlier in the modern period, people said, no, this is just myth. Notice the overreach. A little bit later, this guy goes and discovers Troy. And oh, I guess, well, does that mean what's in Homer in the Iliad? Did that really happen? This is really hard questions to answer. And the problem is that you actually have skepticism on both sides. Now, a lot of people blame the Reformation for this. And, well, they have a point. The Reformation certainly is a big piece of the puzzle in terms of how this happened. But as with many things, it's harder to just either credit this or blame this to, let's say, Germans and Martin Luther, who revolted from the church and the Holy Roman Empire, actually the picture, and the more we study this, is a lot more complex. I want to start with, um, with Will Durant's The Reformation. He has kind of a nice section on the case against the church, and he basically makes the case against the church in the late medieval period based on its corruption. Five, the case against the church. Shall we recapitulate the charges made by loyal Catholics against the church of the 14th and 15th centuries? The first and sorest was that she loved money and had too much of it for her own good. In the Centum Gravamina, or 100 Grievances listed against the church by the Diet of Nuremberg in 1522, 
It was alleged that she owned half the wealth of Germany. A Catholic historian reckoned the church's share as a third in Germany and a fifth in France. But a procurer general of the Parlement calculated in 1502 that three quarters of all French wealth was ecclesiastical. No statistics are available to check these estimates. In Italy, of course, one third of the peninsula belonged to the church as the papal states, and she owned rich properties in the rest. In any society, the majority of abilities is contained in a minority of men. Therefore, sooner or later, the majority of goods, privileges, and powers will be possessed by a minority of men. Wealth became concentrated in the church in the Middle Ages because she served vital functions and was herself served by the ablest men. The Reformation, in one aspect, was a redistribution of this naturally concentrated wealth by the secular appropriation of ecclesiastical property or revenues. Six factors served to accumulate lands in the possession of the church. One, most of those who bequeathed property left something to her as fire insurance, and as the church controlled the making and probating of wills, her agents were in a position to encourage such legacies. Two, since ecclesiastical property was safer than other property from ravage by bandits, soldiers, or governments, some persons, for security, deeded their lands to the church, held them as her vassals, and surrendered all right to them at death. Others willed part or all of their property to the church on condition that she should provide for them in sickness or old age. In this way, the church offered disability insurance. Three, crusaders had sold or mortgaged and forfeited lands to ecclesiastical bodies to raise cash for their venture. Four, hundreds of thousands of acres had been earned for the church by the reclamation work of monastic orders. Five, land once acquired by the church was inalienable could not be sold or given away by any of her personnel, except through discouragingly complex means. Six, church property was normally free from taxation by the state. Occasionally, however, kings reckless of damnation forced levies from the clergy or found legal dodges to confiscate some portion of ecclesiastical wealth. The rulers of northern Europe might have grumbled less about the riches of the church if the income therefrom, or the multifarious contributions of the faithful, had remained within the national boundaries. They fretted at the sight of northern gold flowing in a thousand streamlets to Rome. The church, however, looked upon herself as the chief agent in maintaining morality, social order, education, literature, scholarship, and art. The state relied upon her to fulfill these functions. To perform them, she needed an extensive and expensive organization. To finance this, she taxed and gathered fees. Even a church could not be governed by paternosters. Many bishops were the civil as well as the ecclesiastical rulers of their regions. Most of them were appointed by lay authorities and came of patrician stock accustomed to easy morals and luxuries. They taxed and spent like princes. Sometimes in the performance of their multiple functions, they scandalized the saints by donning armor and lustily leading their troops in war. Cardinals were chosen rarely for their piety, usually for their wealth or political connections or administrative capacity. They looked upon themselves not as monks burdened with vows, but as the senators and diplomats of a rich and powerful state. In many instances they were not priests, and they did not let their red hats impede their enjoyment of life. The church forgot the poverty of the apostles and the needs and expenses of power. Being worldly, the servants of the church were often as venal as the officials of contemporary governments. Corruption was in the mores of the time and in the nature of man. Secular courts were notoriously amenable to the persuasiveness of money, and no papal election could rival in bribery the election of Charles V as emperor. This accepted, the fattest bribes in Europe were paid at the Roman court. Reasonable fees had been fixed for the services of the curia, but the cupidity of the staff raised the actual cost to twenty times the legal sum. Dispensations could be had from almost any canonical impediment, almost any sin, provided the inducement was adequate. Aeneas Silvius, before becoming pope, wrote that everything was for sale in Rome, and that nothing could be had there without money. A generation later, the monks of Anarola, with the exaggeration of indignation, called the Church of Rome a harlot, ready to sell her favors for a coin. Another generation later, Erasmus remarked, The shamelessness of the Roman Curia has reached its climax. Pastor writes, A deep-rooted corruption had taken possession of nearly all the officials of the Curia. The inordinate number of gratuities and exactions passed all bounds. Moreover, on all sides, deeds were dishonestly manipulated and even falsified by the officials. No wonder that there arose from all parts of Christendom the loudest complaints about the corruption and financial extortions of the papal officials. It was unusual for impecunious merit to mount in the church of the 15th century. 
from the moderate fee charged for priestly ordination to the enormous sums that many cardinals paid for their elevation, nearly every appointment required the clandestine lubrication of superiors. A favorite papal device for raising funds was to sell ecclesiastical offices, or, as the popes saw the matter, to appoint to sinecures or honors, even to the cardinalate, persons who would make a substantial contribution to the expenses of the church. Alexander VI created 80 new offices and received 760 ducats, about $19,000, from each of the appointees. Julius II formed a college or bureau of 101 secretaries, who together paid him 74,000 ducats for the privilege. Leo X nominated 60 chamberlains and 141 squires to the papal household and received from them 202,000 ducats. The salaries paid to such officials were looked upon by giver and recipient as endowment policy annuities, but to Luther they seemed the rankest simony. In thousands of cases, the appointee lived far away from the benefice, the parish or abbacy or episcopacy, whose revenues supported his labor or luxury, and one man might be the absentee beneficiary of several such posts. So the active Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia, Alexander VI to be, received from a variety of benefices an income of 70,000 ducats, about $1,750,000 a year. And now, now, this book was written in the, oh gosh, maybe the 50s. So um, if you're looking at, you know, almost two million dollars a year. Uh, today it would be quite a bit more. So yeah, that's a lot of money. And his furious foe, Cardinal de la Rovere, later Julius II, held at one time the Archbishopric of Avignon, the bishoprics of Bologna, Lausanne, Coutances, Viviers, Mende, Ostia, and Valletri, and the abbacies of Nanantola and Grotta Ferrata. By this pluralism, the Church maintained her major executives and in many instances, scholars, poets, and scientists. So Petrarch, sharp critic of the Avignon popes, lived on the sinecures that they granted him. Erasmus, who satirized a hundred ecclesiastical follies, regularly received church pensions. And Copernicus, who did most damage to medieval Christianity, lived for years on church benefices involving a minimum of distraction from his scientific pursuits. A more serious charge than pluralism was laid against the personal morality of the clergy. The morals of the clergy are corrupt, said the Bishop of Torcello in 1458. They have become an offense to the laity. Of the four orders of friars founded in the 13th century, Franciscans, Dominicans, Carmelites, Augustinians, all but the last had become scandalously lax in piety and discipline. The monastic rules formulated in the fervor of early devotion proved too rigorous for a human nature increasingly freed from supernatural fears. Absolved by their collective wealth from the necessity of manual labor, thousands of monks and friars neglected religious services, wandered outside their walls, drank in taverns, and pursued amours. A 14th century Dominican, John Bromyard, said of his fellow friars, those who should be the fathers of the poor covet delicate food and enjoy morning sleep. Very few vouchsafe their presence at matins or mass. They are consumed in gluttony and drunkenness, not to say in uncleanliness, so that now the assemblies of clerics are thought to be brothels of wanton folk and congregations of play actors. Erasmus repeated the charge after a century. Many convents of men and women differ little from public brothels. Petrarch drew a favorable picture of discipline and devotion in the Carthusian monastery where his brother lived, and several convents in Holland and western Germany retained the spirit of study and piety that had formed the brethren of the common life and produced the imitation of Christ. Yet Johannes Trithemius, abbot of Sponheim, circa 1490, denounced the monks of this Rhenish Germany with violent hyperbole. The three vows of religion are as little heeded by these men as if they had never promised to keep them. The whole day is spent in filthy talk. Their whole time is given to play and gluttony. In open possession of private property, each dwells in his own private lodging. They never fear nor love God. They have no thought of the life to come, preferring their fleshly lusts to the needs of the soul. They scorn the vow of poverty, know not that of chastity, revile that of obedience. The smoke of their filth ascends all around. Guy Jouenot, a papal commissary sent to reform the Benedictine monasteries of France, turned in a gloomy report in 1503. And many monks gamble, curse, haunt inns, carry swords, gather riches, fornicate, live the life of bacchanals, and are more worldly than the mere worldling. Were I minded to relate all those things that have come under my own eyes, I should make too long a tale of it. 
In the growing disorder of the monasteries, a great number of them neglected those admirable works of charity, hospitality, and education which had entitled them to public trust and support. Said Pope Leo X in 1516, the lack of rule in the monasteries of France and the immodest life of the monks have come to such a pitch that neither kings, princes, nor the faithful at large have any respect left for them. A recent Catholic historian sums up the matter, as of 1490, with possibly excessive severity. Read the innumerable testimonies of this time, historical anecdotes, rebukes of moralists, satires of scholars and poets, papal bulls, synodal constitutions. What do they say? Always the same facts and the same complaints. The suppression of conventual life, of discipline, of morals. Prodigious is the number of monastic robbers and debauchees, to realize their disorders, we must read the details revealed by judicial inquiry as to the internal state of the majority of the great abbeys. The abuses among the Carthusians were so great that the order was in ill repute almost everywhere. Monastic life had disappeared from the nunneries. All contributed to transform these asylums of prayer into centers of dissipation and disorder. The secular clergy, if we take a lenient attitude toward concubinage, present a better picture than the friars and monks. The chief sin of the simple parish priest was his ignorance, but he was too poorly paid and hard-worked to have funds or time for study, and the piety of the people suggests that he was often respected and loved. Violations of the sacerdotal vow of chastity were frequent. In Norfolk, England, out of 73 accusations of incontinence filed in 1499, 15 were against clergymen. In Ripon, out of 126, 24. In Lambeth, out of 58, 9. In other words, clerical offenders numbered some 23% of the total, though the clergy were probably less than 2% of the population. Some confessors solicited sexual favors from female penitents. Thousands of priests had concubines. In Germany, nearly all. In Rome, it was assumed that priests kept concubines, and some reports estimated the prostitutes there at 6,000 in a population not exceeding 100,000. To quote again a Catholic historian, it is not surprising, when the highest ranks of the clergy were in such a state, that among the regular orders and secular priests, vice and irregularities of all sorts should become more and more common. The salt of the earth had lost its savor. But it is a mistake to suppose that the corruption of the clergy was worse in Rome than elsewhere. There is documentary evidence of the immorality of the priests in almost every town in the Italian peninsula. No wonder, as contemporary writers sadly testify, the influence of the clergy had declined and in many places hardly any respect was shown for the priesthood. Their immorality was so gross that suggestions in favor of allowing priests to marry began to be heard. Okay, there's, there's a ton about the roots of the Protestant Reformation, and it's helpful to read a lot of the books that have come out in the last 20 years tend to downplay this type of material. This is this is an older work, uh, paying attention that, in fact, the Protestant Reformation did not come to um, significant Roman Catholic strongholds like Spain and France and Italy. It was it was often in Northern Europe, and of course the, the history in England is its own case. But there are a lot of reasons that the Protestant Reformation got going, and the Reformation had a significant... When I first started doing the, the, the Genesis series, I talked a lot about the fact that in the period of the Pre of the Protestant Reformation, leaving the Renaissance, you have Renaissance humanism, and you have this turn to the books, and you have Erasmus and Luther, and this turning to the text. And in a sense, the church seems so utterly compromised, surely we can find, surely we can find the kind of solid ground in the text itself. And of course, Erasmus, now with the printing press, begins, I, I, I did a lot out of that um, oh, fatal discord, a great book comparing Erasmus and Luther, my conversations with Ron Dart back then. So there, there were a, people turned to the text, and, and in a sense, that's turning to the upper register, because if we look at the church and we look at the monasteries, there's so much corruption. Surely if we look to, now what will happen in the Protestant Reformation, the word of God, something that comes down to us, something that isn't compromised by the, the greed and the venality of the clergy, surely here we can begin to see um, a solid, solid ground upon which we can build um, we can build our 
our new civilization. Now, again, there are massive social things going on. You had the beginning of globalization with the discovery of the Americas. You Again, you have the end of the Middle Ages. You have urbanization. You have massive changes now in literacy. Looking forward to Jordan Peterson addressing that and some of the trailers for his um, Logos and Literacy series that's coming out. So enormous things are underway now with the with the coming of the printing press. And, and with all of this is in some ways the reduction of the wilds of the medieval period, much of which sort of we see reversing through what we see going on now. Turning people into good Christians was not just a matter of policing their behavior and punishing offenders. For many in the 16th and 17th century, to reform was to engage in a cosmic war against Satan and his minions. And it was a struggle in which the devil was no metaphor, but rather a real presence, as real as all the innumerable human beings believed to be in league with him or under his grip. For an unnerving glimpse into such a worldview, let us turn once again to the case of Chancellor Niklaus Krell, that crypto-Calvinist offender mentioned in the previous chapter. Krell's crime of crypto-Calvinism was interpreted by many of his Lutheran contemporaries as much worse than mere heterodoxy. Krell was considered an agent of the devil, and the common people of Saxony were apparently convinced of this through certain signs in nature itself. Among the many odd natural wonders, Wunder, seen by his contemporaries as portents and signs that predicted Krell's crypto-Calvinist betrayal of Saxony and his eventual downfall, the following might seem most bizarre in our day and age. Some women were reported to have given birth to toads and to children with mustaches. An image of Christ had begun to bleed profusely. Signs resembling bloody swords had been seen in the sky. Anguished cries had been heard in the clouds, and ghosts seven feet tall had walked through the church at Zwickau, interrupting the Sunday service. In addition, many Saxons elsewhere had seen the devil in various guises, and he had manifested himself with flaming horns in the marketplace of Ellenburg, and produced violent thunderstorms that frightened everyone half to death. And that was not all. Krell, it was said, received frequent visits from the devil. The prison guards at the Königstein fortress testified that Satan himself came to Krell's cell as a black bird and spoke with him in a language that they could not understand. Reports also circulated that an imprisoned crypto-Calvinist friend of Krell's, the court preacher David Steinbach, had been freed from his cell by the devil, and that after being captured, he had confessed that the devil had been visiting him for a long time, occasionally using his wash basin and leafing through his books. Demonizing one's enemies was nothing new. Neither was the inclination to entwine the natural, preternatural, and supernatural. That braiding was one of the chief characteristics of the transition to modernity, and one of its chief problems, too. Heaven hung too low, and the fires of hell roiled high enough to singe the earth and its atmosphere. Demonizing could be metaphorical at times, certainly, but even in such instances, the imagery reified deeply held beliefs that affirmed the menacing reality of the devil. Moreover, all things diabolical were inseparably linked to a belief system in which pre-Christian, non-Christian, and Christian elements were thoroughly mixed. By the 16th century, elites such as Erasmus of Rotterdam and Guillaume Brissonnet were inveighing against such unholy intermingling, calling for a return to a pure Christianity stripped bare of all traces of superstition and heathenism. The Protestant goal of restoring the church to ancient, pristine forms through scripture alone flowed naturally from this late medieval reformist thrust. Ad fontes and sola scriptura were but two sides of the same coin, or, better yet, two sides of the same scraper with which all of the barnacles that clung to the ship of salvation were to be stripped away. But identifying all the barnacles, so to speak, proved immensely difficult, as the ship's hull had planks made of fossilized barnacles. In other words, many elements of Christian belief and practice were of ancient origin, and thus linked to an extra-biblical matrix. This was especially true of all things demonic, and to some extent, of magic, and of the many behaviors that could be deemed superstitions. A murky haze hung over the devil, clouding all beliefs and rites associated with him. This fog can be attributed to two factors. First, since the Christian devil was an amalgam of ancient Near Eastern and European folklore, and since much of demonological lore was extra-biblical, clear definitions did not begin to emerge until the 15th century, and even then, there was much disagreement on the part of experts. Second, many of the rites and beliefs that came... But, but now notice the need for definitions. And if you look at what 
Sheldrake had been talking about. In, in this period now, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to get at a pure church. We're trying to strip away these other things. And so, okay, well, let's get at, if we can define what we're talking about here, then maybe we can begin to do the careful teasing things away to, to purify the church. Seem to be associated with the devil and to be rejected by the church as magic and superstition were deeply embedded in European culture and most often concerned mundane vicissitudes of life, health, fertility, love, finances, rather than spiritual issues. Discerning the difference between what was truly divine or neutral or demonic or between religion and certain ancient problem-solving strategies deemed magical was never simple and required some hermeneutic, that is, some set of guidelines for interpreting phenomena according to specific preconceived assumptions. The same was true when it came to determining where the line should be drawn between magic and religion, or magic and superstition, or religion and superstition. To further complicate matters, sorcery and witchcraft were added to the mix in the 15th century too, and linked to the devil, adding yet more distinctions to be made and more areas of aberrant piety to be eradicated. By the dawn of the 16th century, the devil can be linked to three very murky categories of deviancy, magic, superstition, and witchcraft. These categories were fuzzy because medieval theologians had never reached consensus on the interpretation of these three deviant forms of belief and ritual. Worse yet, the exact meaning of the concepts and terms remained a contentious issue into the eve of the Reformation era, even as campaigns were mounted to combat magic, superstition, witchcraft, and the devil. And not surprisingly, with the advent of the Protestant Reformation, disagreements became even more intense and numerous. In the 16th century, binary oppositions such as magic religion, superstition religion, demonic heavenly, gained intensity, and their meaning grew ever more unstable and divisive. Ironically, even though they could not agree on how to combat the devil, magic, and superstition, Catholics and Protestants alike agreed that such combat was absolutely necessary. So it came to pass that as Catholics launched campaigns against the devil, magic, superstition, and witchcraft, Protestants waged a similar war at the very same time, in which they railed constantly against much of Catholic ritual as demonic, magical, and superstitious. Though the primary sources themselves sometimes blur distinctions when dealing with practices condemned by both Catholics and Protestants, making it difficult for us to deal with them in isolation from one another, they can nonetheless be separated into four categories, in each of which the devil played some part. The first and most nebulous deviant category is superstition. It was an ancient Latin term, which pagan Romans employed in reference to any beliefs or practices that falsely and foolishly placed faith in supernatural causes. Much like the term pornography in the 21st century, superstition was hard to define, but relatively easy to identify. St. Augustine poked fun at a few of the superstitions of his late 4th century Roman world. To hold your left thumb in your right hand when you hiccup. To tread upon the threshold when you go out in front of the house. To go back to bed if anyone should sneeze when you are putting on your slippers. To return home if you stumble when going to a place. When your clothes are eaten by mice, to be more frightened at the prospect of coming misfortune than grieved by your present loss. Augustine did more than ridicule superstition. He gave it greater definition by linking all of it to demons. At the same time, he broadened its meaning too, linking it to magic, idolatry, and devotion to the devil. He was not the first to do so. By his day, Christians had already given superstition an objective yet still very fuzzy definition as any false religion or any observance not sanctioned by the church. In fact, by Augustine's day, Christians had already been teaching for a long time that all religions other than their own came from the devil, and that it was through demonic deceit that the human race had been lured away from worship of the one true God. Augustine, the most revered and oft-cited of the Latin Church Fathers, bequeathed this thinking to the West. In the 5th century, Pope Leo I would affirm it, proposing that the devil gained control of the human race through superstitiones. Adopting such a teaching meant, in practical terms, that whether or not one was aware, all rites and observances not sanctioned by the church put one in league with the devil, or worse, they were de facto acts of demonic veneration. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas would define superstition as a vice opposed to religion by way of excess, not because in the worship of God it does more than true religion, but because it offers divine worship to beings other than God, or offers worship to God in an improper manner. Superstition, then, was taken to be the root of false religion and of all idolatry. In the 16th century, idolatry would become a fighting word with diverging and diametrically opposed meanings. 
For the Catholics who ventured to the Americas and Asia, all the religions they encountered were nothing but superstition and idolatry. For the Protestants in Europe, all of Catholic worship was idolatrous and superstitious. In both cases, the recognition of any idolatry was conjoined with an effort to wipe it out as something demonic, and with the actual annihilation of sacred art. The second closely related category was magic, or the occult, or hidden arts. For Augustine, who died in 430 as the Vandals were ravaging the Roman Empire, magic was all about incantations, signs, divinations, auguries, amulets, cures, and consultations and arrangements about signs and leagues with devils. It was all demonically induced delusion and fornication of the soul. For Pope Leo I, merely one generation after Augustine, the practice of magic was actually the ultimate outcome of superstition and of commerce with demons. In the 7th century, Isidore of Seville would further codify magic, providing medieval theologians with a long detailed list of the various types of illicit practices supported by demons. This conception of magic as an inherently demonic and practically oriented attempt to effect changes on the world, or to gain knowledge of its workings, or foreknowledge of future events, would become church doctrine and guide its policies toward European folk beliefs in the Middle Ages. By the 13th century, the church's duty to combat magic as something dangerous was widely recognized by elite authorities. Thomas Aquinas summed it up as follows. Man has not been entrusted with power over the demons to employ them to whatever purpose he will. On the contrary, it is appointed that he should wage war against the demons. Hence, in no way is it lawful for man to make use of the demons' help by compacts either tacit or express. Under this rubric of magic fell a long list of practices, many inseparable from folk customs or even folk medicine. As anthropologists have revealed, medieval Christians did not always know how to make even the most fundamental distinctions. In one notorious case, a 13th century inquisitor found some peasants in southern France who tried to revive their dead infants by dunking them in a cold stream and invoking the aid of a dog they called saint Guinfort. The fact that the intercessor was a dog and that the ritual was not sanctioned by the church did not seem to matter to the local folk, who, according to archaeological evidence, stuck to their illicit devotions until the 19th century. But it certainly did matter to the inquisitor who first discovered this peculiar devotion and tried, unsuccessfully, to stamp it out. In the late Middle Ages, the gap between theology and popular piety widened in the minds of learned elites, and the theological perspective taken by many of them left much of popular piety in the hands of the devil, or cast it into the benighted realm of superstition. By the 16th century, Erasmus would be complaining that all pilgrimages and the veneration of relics were not much different from the cult of St. Guinfort, or from the magical arts, and the Protestant reformers would take one step beyond Erasmus and dismiss nearly all of Catholic ritual as devilish magic. The third category, narrower than superstition and magic, was sorcery or witchcraft. Although the ultimate definition of witchcraft was not fully developed until the 15th century, I skip a little bit ahead. The campaign against this kind of mundane superstition had begun in the late Middle Ages, but it was conducted at a learned level by elite reformists rather than at the parish level. Intellectuals such as Jean Gerson, 1363 to 1492, Chancellor of the University of Paris, could decry the many superstitions that existed in his day, but lacked the means to put an end to them. Gerson expanded the definition of superstition to include certain practices, attitudes, and expectations that had crept into legitimate rites of the Catholic Church. There are many things introduced under the appearance of religion among simple Christians, he said, which it would have been more holy to have omitted. He thus brought the critique of superstition inside the church, so to speak, calling attention to offenses within it. Others, and in particular Guillaume Brissonnet and Erasmus of Rotterdam, followed suit, further developing this internal scrutiny along humanist lines, pushing for an ad fontes house cleaning that would bring the church back to its pristine first century state. Brissonnet and Erasmus refused to condemn the rights of the church outright, but their critique of superstition took a more radical turn among their followers. When contemporaries of Erasmus blamed him for laying the egg hatched by Luther, most of them had in mind the Erasmian attack on superstition within the Catholic Church. From 1517 on, this critique would be taken in two different paths. Within the Catholic Church, many continued to campaign against superstitious practices and attitudes, but refrained from arguing that any sanctioned rites were superstitious in and of themselves. Within the emerging Protestant camp, the critique turned sharply against Catholicism itself and all its rituals which also forced Catholics to engage in a much more vigorous house-cleaning than ever before. 
The two paths did link up at some points, especially in regard to obviously non-Christian practices, but they remained opposites. Protestants all agreed that the Roman Catholic Church was thoroughly corrupted by superstition from top to bottom, and much of their war on superstition consisted of their rejection of Catholic piety. Luther retained much more of medieval folk religion than any other major reformers, especially in regard to all things diabolical, but he nonetheless rejected much of Catholic ritual as useless works righteousness, especially those rites that gave the impression of guaranteeing a predictable outcome. Pilgrimages, the blessing of objects, the use of holy water, the veneration of saints and their relics, the wearing of holy medals, for example. In the Reformed camp, superstition was a much greater concern than the delusion of works righteousness, and the attack on Catholic piety was more severe. So when you have someone like Rupert Sheldrake talking about pilgrimages and holy places and cathedrals, well, this is sort of, again, a rewilding. It's sort of a, a going back to these practices before the Reformation. As Reformed Protestants saw it, the central miracle of the Catholic faith, transubstantiation, was no more than hocus-pocus, literally the mumbled, hocused corpus meum of Eucharistic consecration transformed into a magical incantation, every bit as mystifying as the word abracadabra. In 1521, Luther's disregard for the power of rituals was surpassed by that of his colleague Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, who called for the abolition of images and much of Catholic ritual, including the Mass. Karlstadt's extreme point of view was shared by the Swiss reformers, all of whom undertook a campaign against Catholic ritual as superstition and idolatry. From Switzerland, this aggressive rejection of Catholic ritual was passed on to all other churches in the Reformed tradition, including that of England. Eventually, in all places where Protestantism took root and flourished, papistry, superstition, and idolatry became synonymous, and little tolerance would be shown toward anything that smacked of Catholicism. In response to Protestantism, the Catholic Church reaffirmed the absolute legitimacy of its rituals, and at the very same time also initiated a campaign to fight superstition on two fronts, internally in regard to valid rituals, and externally in regard to practices it deemed unchristian. Relying on scholastic theology, the Catholic Church took a more methodical approach to the issue of superstition, dividing it into four different types, the improper worship of the true God, idolatry, divination, and vain observances, which include magic and occult arts. Such distinctions were incomprehensible to most of the laity, and some of the clergy too, but they mattered to those who were in charge of enforcing correctness. The fourth category of vain observances was the broadest and involved the greatest number of people, since it covered everything from the trivial, such as remedies for hiccups, to the very worst, such as witchcraft. The Council of Trent did not delve deeply into the problem of superstition, but it did issue a call on bishops to prohibit and abolish all those things which have been introduced by irreverence, which can scarcely be separated from impiety, or by superstition, that false imitation of true piety. Concerning the one area of Catholic piety where reformists had detected the most intense superstition, the directives of Trent were clear, but not very specific. In the invocation of saints, the veneration of relics, and the sacred use of images, ordered the council, every superstition shall be removed. In a similar vein, but with more detailed instructions, Trent also demanded that all the superstitious abuses that surrounded the Mass be done away with. That no place may be given to superstition, they shall, by edict and under penalties laid down, that priests take care not to celebrate at other than due hours, nor make use of other rites or other ceremonies and prayers in the celebration of masses besides those which have been approved by the church. They shall wholly remove from the church the observance of a fixed number of certain masses and of candles as being invented rather by superstitious worship than by true religion. These reforms were quickly implemented in some places, such as Spain, and more gradually in others, such as Germany. By the early 1600s, much of what had offended purists, such as Erasmus, was still in place, but the more blatant superstitions surrounding Catholic worship had in many places been greatly reduced. Much harder to combat, and even harder to exterminate, was the vast throng of ancient beings and spirits from local folklore who infested the landscape. Fairies, gnomes, trolls, elves, pixies, sprites, gremlins, goblins, nymphs, duendes, leprechauns, imps, and others of their ilk. These beings were the stuff of myth and of the popular imagination. Some were spiritual, others physical. The Catholic Church had long taught that such beings were but demons, and Protestants took the same tack, so their existence was implicitly reaffirmed. 
Though demonized and therefore subjected to the same treatment as all things diabolical, these beings stubbornly clung to the collective imagination. Banishing them from folklore, art, and literature was even harder, as proved by William Shakespeare's play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, written in the 1590s as the war against superstition and the devil was beginning to peak, and by the works of the Baroness d'Aulnois, 1650-1705, who not only wrote about fairies a century after Shakespeare, but also coined the term fairy tale in her book title Conte des Fées, 1697. If the war against the devil had been entirely successful, this genre of literature, which only gained in popularity with the passage of time, would never have come into existence. Ghosts were even harder to dispel. The interweaving of folk culture and religion was particularly tight on the subject of ghosts, principally because of the Catholic Church's teachings on purgatory. That souls in purgatory could visit the living was an ancient belief sanctioned by the Church and reinforced by it in myriad ways. From St. Gregory the Great's dialogues of the 6th century through many medieval texts and up to the eve of the Reformation, the appearance of souls from purgatory was a common theme in literature, sermons, and especially monastic piety. Most ghostly visits had a common purpose, to ask the living to do more for the soul in purgatory or to inform the living that their suffrages had worked. But there were also accounts in popular culture that veered from the straight and narrow. In these tales, ghosts appeared for all sorts of reasons, some of them most profane, such as to request vengeance. The church taught that many ghostly apparitions were really demonic, and that it was very easy for the devil to fool one into thinking that one was seeing a ghost. Discerning whether an apparition was a genuine revenant, a human visitor from the hereafter, or a demon, was tricky, but in most cases the decision hinged on what the ghost spoke about or requested, for normally genuine ghosts should deal only with one subject, purgatory. All right, and this is from the book Reformations by Carlos Eri. And it's a, it's a, the whole thing is just a fascinating book. So when Rupert Sheldrake talks about the Orthodox and you see sort of a new interest in Orthodoxy, you can see interest in a church tradition that didn't pass through everything that was happening in Europe during these times. Now, what gets going with the Protestant Reformation and what, what eventually happens is, of course, there's wars that go back and forth. And Scripture doesn't seem to offer the world the kind of significant, sure platform it did before. Uh, Jordan B. Cooper just had a very interesting um, video pushing back on some of John Verveke's um, treatment of Luther in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I thought when I was listening to it, when it came out, that actually that was one of the weaker areas of, of John's work. Um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot more nuance in the, uh, in the Protestant Reformation um, and more characters than was brought out. And so Jordan B. Cooper, who's a scholar in this area, has a lot higher resolution on a lot of this stuff. And so they are going to talk. And so I'm really looking forward to that talk. I thought Jordan B. Cooper's conversation with Jonathan Peugeot a while ago was also an excellent talk. But, you know, when I when I point to a lot of things, number one, in terms of the venality, the sexual abuse, the, uh, the financial abuse that was common in late medieval period in the monasteries and in Roman Catholic Church, you can sort of understand why Luther went after the monasteries and why the population went after the monasteries in a big way in the Netherlands and in Germany and in England because they were seen as just plain um, places of, of absolute corruption. You can see how, so, so again, you had all this turning to the sources, but then when the sources don't produce what Luther had hoped the sources would produce because you have the sources and then reason, and I can, I think, Jordan B. Cooper nicely talked talked about reason. Well, well, this is going to lead somehow lead for lead towards the reform of the church. And again, if we look at Calvin, I spoke about did I did yeah I did, I did Calvin and uh, Kanye um, a while ago. If you look at if you look at Calvin, Calvin very much wants to have this um, you know the just city emerge, and and this is very much connected with the city of God. There's all sorts of connections that we don't have when we think about these things today. But if you look, for example, at the pilgrims and the Puritans coming to the New World, they're going to carve out the city of God in the wilderness, and they're going to bring 
the the natives in in with them and i mean it's that that's this entire story but of course the protestant reformation continues to develop and the wars continue to ravage europe and and then there's looking there's a look towards a new place a new way that we can that we can find surety and then you have sort of rationalism and empiricism uh, jordan peterson's uh observation via jung that you know maybe maybe now using the physical world we can in fact achieve some of the kingdom-esque gains that the, the church didn't seem to produce. And of course, once the scientific revolution begins to take place, and again, I think Christianity is absolutely central to the scientific revolution. If you go to Jordan Peterson's conversation with Matt Ridley, I think Peterson lays that argument out quite well. You have this movement, and of course, you'll have Descartes, you'll have sort of the, and again, um, Rupert Sheldrake talked about, you have this division between the natural and the supernatural, and all of this takes off and continues to go. Into the 19th century, in many respects, before Darwin, you've got sort of an implicit agreement that the Bible and Christianity will dictate the world of morals, because of course you can't get an it is from an ought, you can't get you can't get morality from science. Science might, science and technology might tell you what you can do, but it won't tell you what you should do. And so, really, up until the end of the Cold War, the nineteen, the nineteen fifties and early sixties in the United States, Christianity dominated sort of the moral perspective of the country. But as developments in geology, biology, Darwin, as all of this sort of picks up, there's there's less and less confidence that the Bible can be trusted to deliver on what today we think of as history, which has a whole lot of science in it. Now again, history always understood the relationship between words and physical correspondence. You know, historians have always debated, well, what, this, again, this is our tells, what really happened. When we say what really happened, we mean what physically happened. When we say literally, we should probably be saying physically because the question is, how do these propositions line up with physical correspondence? All of this impacts biblical scholarship in a very deep way. Biblical scholarship begins to focus on um, the, the grammatical historical method. Well, what's why those two words, grammatical and historical? Grammatical because we have the text there. We can look at the grammar. We can study the words. We can study how words are used in all these different places. So we're going to look at the grammatical layer of the text. We're also going to look at the way that the text delivers on corresponding to physical history, okay? And that's going to be then the preoccupation of biblical scholarship, especially in the middle and late modern period. What, what happens as you get into the late 20th century period, early 21st century period, increasingly, and you'll see this in mainline, you'll see this on libs of TikTok or with a woke preacher, um, the woke preacher account on Twitter is, well, you can find this sermon from a woman at the uh, Riverside Church, which is this cathedral built by the Rockefellers, which was this mainline cathedral in um, right there on Manhattan Island, a building that I visited often as a youth. My father actually conducted a wedding in there. My father liked to this place and we go up to the bell towers and look at the bells um, every now and then when we would visit New York City. But this this basically you'd have this this woman was preaching and she pretty much delivered well, we, we can't really, if David was a man after God's own heart and David was a rapist of Bathsheba, therefore we simply can't, we simply can't believe the text 
to believe that David would be a man after God's own heart because he was clearly immoral. Now, when you listen to um, Mark Vernon talk about, in the previous video that I did about Tom Holland and morality, part of Mark Vernon's complaint is that, well, Tom Holland, this is about moralism, which I don't think he's getting Tom Holland right, so I'm on Sheldrake's side in that little conversation. But even, let's say, Tim Keller, when he's complaining about wokishness, he will note that, well, this has, take, this has taken an extremely moralistic turn. So morality gets unhitched from the Bible in the 20th century in many ways the way historicism, ideas of modern history get decoupled from the Bible with skepticism arising out of geology, out of Darwin, and about all of these kinds of things. So when our friend, the cosmic skeptic, jumps right to this question of, did things really happen? He's just basically following along the trajectory of, in many respects, modernist biblical scholars because their concerns are to what degree does the Bible tell us what really happened in terms of Moses and Egypt and, and all of these things. When I was in seminary in the 1980s, biblical scholarship was already, was already turning from this preoccupation with modernist concerns. And scholars such as Robert Alter, a Jewish scholar from Berkeley, as he was beginning to look at the Bible as literature, as literary devices in the text, as this is the way that they are attempting to communicate with us, and we're finding all of these things in the text, this actually had, um, this actually gave us fresh purchase. Now, the modernist fundamentalist fight was all about these historical concerns. And so increasingly, uh, liberals were coming around and saying, it doesn't matter whether or not these things happen, they're mythological, and so all that matters is the story. Fundamentalists would answer and say, no, actually, it really does matter. Well, why? Well, because if we don't have confidence that Christ can do miracles, because again, Christ's miracles were counted as evidence for the credibility of, of Christianity up until the modern period. And then suddenly those stories were seen as um, discrediting the texts. You see the change in the philosophical environment. And so then in the modern period, the fundamentalists and evangelicals in their tradition would say, no, these things really happened. And so that's where you get this fight. And when you have someone like Cosmic Skeptic continuing on in this battle, and you can find plenty of other people doing it in YouTube, on in this battle, well, there it is. Now, very quickly, someone like myself and anybody who's watched my channel knows that in terms of the really happened side, I'm on the side of Jesus' miracles and Jesus' physical resurrection, and I'm not enormously skeptical about the... Um, Again, in my denomination, a lot of this stuff was debated in the 1970s, and they came up with a word called event character, which um, I think is a pretty good description. Because if you ask of, let's say, January 6 around the Capitol building, the entire debate is not about what did or didn't happen. In many respects, a lot of that people don't really care. What they really care about is, in fact, the event character. Did a um, did a seated president of the United States try to overthrow an election? That's the question, because it's the event character. Now, what's happening now is that part of the reason you don't see debates in the biblical series about physical correspondence is because and I'm going to have to do another video on this. Jordan's approach to the Bible comes from a very different way than traditional, traditional ideas and traditional pictures about 
God delivering messages to the prophets. Now, even how we look at those pictures, again, I'm not expressing skepticism, but Lewis, again, walks through a lot of this in his book, Miracles. The, the, the mental pictures that we have are important, but they're the mental pictures that we have. And so much of what these new atheists do is sort of attempt to debunk these mental pictures. And when they have a mental picture of God, they think about that, in my opinion, tremendous error done by Michelangelo. And, and actually, the, the more I begin to understand what Peugeot has to say about the history of images in his iconography, the better I understand his critique of the Renaissance. And the fact that the Roman Catholic Church has that painting, a physical description of an old man on a cloud reaching down. Okay, now some of my iconoclast, I'm not, I'm not recommending anything be done to the Sistine Chapel, don't get me wrong, but some of my iconoclastic Calvinism says, you know, if he hadn't painted that, we probably would be better off because it just sort of feeds into the skeptics who say, well, isn't that God? Isn't that what's painted on the roof of your chapel? Yeah, it is. Doesn't that picture thinking sort of lend a certain, a certain way of approaching these stories? Now, What's happening again is that all of this stuff, when you when you heard the descriptions of corruption in the Roman church in the 13th, 14th, and 15th century, most all of us would say, that's horrible. And in fact, today, looking at the Roman Catholic Church, even if you take a dim view on the wealth of the Vatican or Roman Catholic priest sex scandals, I don't think any of us would argue that the church is in a far better place than it was at that point. And so many of the reforms worked. And part of what happened also that you see is you have this separation what eventually would do, would develop in terms of the separation of church and state, which would come full-blown in the American Constitution. So all of this has produced good fruit. And the, the kinds of practices that Monty Python could poke fun of have in many respects been laid to rest. Um, the, 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 you know, how much, you know, would you have enough relics of the true cross to build a to build Noah's Ark? I mean, all of this stuff that went through. And actually, Wittenberg was the um, the church at Wittenberg had an amazing collection of relics, apparently. So, and which of course would then be <laughs> made lose a tremendous amount of their value thanks to their most famous uh, monk preacher. But all of this stuff had been transforming and changing the world. But now to listen to some of what we hear about mm, the rewilding of the world, about just read Tolkien and Lewis. I mean, Tolkien writes about fairy stories. Lewis, who never goes from Church of England to Protestant or to Roman Catholic, although some people debate he might have, other people said, but just basically by his birth in, in Northern Ireland and, and that he 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 wouldn't, but he saw again saw mere Christianity. We see in the 20th century the beginnings of what we're seeing now in the biblical series, in the interest in Jonathan Peugeot, in the interest of Paul King's North, a rewilding of Christianity in some ways. And is this a, you always have the difficulty. I love what Lewis says when he distinguishes medicine from food. In, in many ways, a lot of what came through the Protestant Reformation was good medicine because there were things that needed to be addressed in the church. But perhaps now after 500 years of taking medicine, some of what we realize at this point is we need a little food. 
And we see that in the rise of Pentecostalism at the beginning of the 20th century. And again, you know, a hundred years might look like a lot to us because we don't live that long. But in church time, the rise of Pentecostalism and 200 years from now, if the Lord tarries, the rise of Pentecostalism will be seen as this enormously important movement in the church. And as some of you had made comments in your in your um, in the videos, there is in many ways, and as we've talked about in this little corner of the internet, the Bridges Mean Discord, there's an interesting commonality between, in some ways, Pentecostalism and Orthodoxy. And again, it all has to do with the 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 reemergent of the wild as let's say this this heavy um heavy hand of certain kinds of protestantism and certain voices in catholicism sort of took down a lot of let's say the enthusiasms the wild enthusiasms that protestantism and the council of trent desired to reform in the church what we're also seeing is that the and I believe it's mostly a bias against a lot of this wildness is now also beginning to reside. So the rest, is, the rest of history is doing a series on teams that are in the World Cup. These little snippets of history from some of the countries that are in the World Cup. And Senegal was in the World Cup. And Tom Holland thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to do something on the African slave trade. And so they did. And the Angore Island, which is a very famous place, it's a World Heritage Site by the United Nations. Now... In many ways, you can see the United Nation as the governmental parallel to the height of the mainline church. Its beliefs in the 1940s, at the end of the World War II, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. In, in many ways, the United Nations is the expression of... of Christian imperialism in the middle of the 20th century. And the trajectory that happens at the United Nations is in some way similar to the trajectory of the mainline church. And so you have this house of slaves, um, which commemorates the one of the places that Africans were put into ships and brought to the Americas. And so Tom Holland was eager to study this. and But the more he dis, he studied it, he began to understand some different things about it. So let's um, let's jump into this. About um, Senegal's prowess on the football field, both because of the, uh, the the victory over France that you mentioned. Also, I think they won the um, the African Cup of Nations. It is indeed. Yes. So they're they're obviously very very good at football. Um, there's one other thing that I know about Senegal, yeah, uh, which is its its most famous tourist attraction, um, and which featured on is one of the 12 original World Heritage Sites that were chosen by UNESCO in 1978. And now there are, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of them. So yeah. Stonehenge Landscape, for instance, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site for now. Right. Um, yeah. uh, maybe removed if they go ahead with their tunnel, who knows? Um, and actually four of those um, 12 original World Heritage Sites, Dominic, uh, feature in our series. So the Galapagos Islands for Ecuador, we... Yes, will feature in our episode on on uh, on Ecuador. Um, two uh, in uh, our Polish episodes of the massive salt mine that goes for hundreds of miles, uh, yep. central Krakow, and Senegal's most visited tourist attraction, which is on the Isle of Gore. Okay. And you may be wondering, well, what is? Have you heard of Gore? I haven't, Tom. I'm looking forward to you educating me about it. <laughs> well, uh, I won't educate you. I will let the UNESCO website oh, that's educate kind. you. So this is what this is how they describe Gore. The island of Gore lies off the coast of Senegal, opposite Dakar. From the 15th to the 19th century... Now, again, this is the UNESCO website. Century, it was the largest slave trading center on the African coast, ruled in succession by the Portuguese, Dutch, English, and French... Its architecture is characterized by the contrast between the grim slave quarters and the elegant houses of the slave traders. Today, it continues to serve as a reminder of human exploitation and as a sanctuary for reconciliation. 
And the most famous building on Gore is um, La Maison des Esclaves, so the House of Slaves, which was built in 1776. Um, it is notorious as a holding center for enslaved Africans. It's kind of uh, redwashed. Um, it's got cellars. Um, with kind of, you know, iron bars in it. Yeah. Um, and it has a doorway that looks out onto the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this is celebrated as the door of no return. And there are famous photographs of it. There's a picture of a, a silhouetted woman standing in this doorway, kind of leaning against it. Um, and this is the door out of which, as the, the Gore Tourist Board puts it, millions of African slaves took the final step from their home continent and onto the slave ships that would transport them if they survived the journey to the new world. Gosh, so it's a very sort of baleful place, yeah. basically. So, so basically, I'm you know putting my hands up, this is pretty much the, the only image of Senegal that came into my mind when, right. we, were, when we were divvying up. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead because the story's going to develop. <laughs> Welcome back to The Rest is History. We're talking about the House of Slaves on the island of Gore in Senegal. Um, and Tom, in the first half, you painted this very evocative picture of the island, of the House of Slaves and the sort of the lanes and streets around it, and of this particular place, this incredibly haunting place, the door of no return, through which, um, how many people was it again? I mean, it was something a like million. a million A million, a million is the claim a million slaves passed, never to return, on their journey to the New World. The problem is that there is no documentary evidence for this claim at all. Right, OK. And there's also no documentary evidence for the, the claim that 20 million slaves were exported from Gore itself. Now, now again, Cosmic Skeptic could jump in here and say, did it really happen? Does it matter? Itself. Because that's a colossal, I mean, that was an eye-watering claim. So the, one, of the, one of the things that is happening in the study of the Atlantic slave trade yeah. is that over the course of the 60s and 70s, at exactly the same time as Gore is being kind of hyped up, yeah. um, you get scholars in uh, US history departments who are conducting systematic research into the Atlantic slave trade. Yeah. And what this research indicates is that um, most of the slaves who are being taken from Senegal are departing from depots at the mouths of the Senegal and, and Gamba rivers, which lie um, north and south of Gore. So not from the House of Slaves at all? No, and the House of Slaves itself, yeah. um, it seems, was never used as a warehouse for slaves. So the cellars in the, in the basement where, you know, you, you go down there and the guys will say this is where slaves were kept before they were transported. Yeah. Uh, they may have been used to house slaves, but if so, they were domestic slaves. They were slaves that were owned by the merchants who, so they who, were slaves the who weren't going anywhere. They were working for the... Yeah, yeah. they're not going to... Yeah, exactly. Um, and the door of no return was not absolutely not an exit point because uh, apparently below it there are rocks. And so it would be dangerous for boats to dock there. So were slaves being transported from the island of Gore at all? Yeah, the estimate is it's about, um, about 500 per annum. Okay, so uh, I mean an, a number, but nowhere near the number that would justify yeah. 20 million or whatever. Exactly so. Now, the guy who comes particularly associated with this, uh, with this research um, is probably the most eminent historian of the Atlantic slave trade of his generation, uh, a man called Philip D. Curtin, who is the professor of history at John Hopkins. Um, his book, the Atlantic Slave Trade, a census came out in 1969, and it was kind of absolutely groundbreaking. Yeah. Um, and he, I mean, I mean, he's very, very upfront in condemning uh, the claims that are made for Gore. He says the whole story is phony. He calls the House of Slaves a hoax. He calls it a scam. And obviously, this does not go down well with the Senegalese tourist authority. No. And it doesn't go down well, firstly, because, um, you know, it's... It's not what you want to hear, have your, you know, your prime tourist attraction condemned as a hoax. But it's also because um, Philip Curtin is white and American. Yeah. Um, and so there's very much a feeling that uh, is it entirely diplomatic for white Americans to undermine, yeah. to be lecturing and to kind of be basically saying that the, the, the research is shoddy? And so there is a, a huge controversy that rages through the 90s, actually often conducted in the pages of Le Monde in, in France, mm -hmm. rather than in America, 
but basically, I would say now that that Curtin's case seems to be pretty generally accepted. As I say, I I knew nothing about this apart from the image of the door of no return. Yeah, just kind of reading around it. So I've been reading around it uh, past week or so. Um, it's pretty much the consensus among Western scholars. So there's um, a professor at Chicago called Ralph Austin, and he says there are literally no historians who believe the slave house is what they're claiming it to be, or that believes Gore was was statistically significant in terms of the slave trade. There's uh, in San- now, of course, Tom Holland has a history of writing, um, getting into things and writing things that get people upset. But it's not Tom in this case, um, because his book in the Shadow of the Sword about the origin story for Islam. In Senegal, there's a very distinguished historian, Abdoulaye Kamara. Again, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, who says that um, he is a historian. I'm not allowed to be sentimental. So. Right. You know. So he, yeah, he says the House of Slaves offers a strong, powerful, sentimental history, but I'm a historian. I'm not allowed to be sentimental. Yeah. And it's also percolated down to the tourist guide, so the Lonely Planet guide to West Africa. Gore's fabricated history boils down to an emotional manipulation by government officials and tour companies of people who come here as part of a genuine search for cultural roots. Cracky, that's pretty strong. Yeah, it is. It is strong. It is strong. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think this kind of raises obviously all kinds of interesting and sensitive questions. Yeah. So the first obvious question is, which I am not qualified to answer because I'm not an African-American, uh-huh. but does it matter if the history is exaggerated? So I found a number of quotations from uh, African-Americans who, who basically say, so, so there's um, in time, in 2004, it ran a story on this whole thing, and it quotes a school teacher, for, uh, a, a, a school teacher from Washington D.C., who says, "There's an unusual human need to have a sacred place. This is ours, even knowing what she even knew. knowing that it's exaggerated." Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kamara says that the door is a symbol, and that the history and memory needs to have a strong symbol. And Dion Brand, who's a Canadian poet and a novelist, um, I mean, she, I think, writes really, really fascinatingly, that the door exists as an absence, a thing, in fact, which we do not know about, a place we do not know. So in in other words, the very fact that it's not what it says it is, is what gives it its power because it points to to everything that has been lost. It points to the 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 way that people have been uprooted, that entire stories have been forgotten, that entire history has been erased. And it's a kind of absent center, if you want to put it like that. So listening to that, Dion Brand, that seems to me a very convoluted way of trying to justify the fact that the, you know, the place you're visiting is not the place you think it is. But on the other hand, I suppose the counter argument would be we in in Britain have loads of historical sites that are bogus you know f- bogus fabricated that we we attribute with all kinds of meaning that's really not necessarily justified i mean i can't think of them i can't pluck them well, off the shelf I, but okay but but i think i think actually the parallel isn't really with tourist sites it's with pilgrimage sites and right. yeah. you know you can you know we've we've done the Kaaba, we've and in that we we talked about the the tomb of christ and or you think about um tombs of saints or whatever you were saying about jerusalem tom that you go to jerusalem and people say well this is calvary this is this press the wrong button uh, now again this gets very interesting if you take tours of jerusalem you have evangelicals i i have seen from from i've never been there but i have seen from um slideshows that Eugene Peterson would say, you know, pastors who go to the Holy Land plague their congregations with, all the evangelicals love the garden tomb. Why? Because the garden tomb is a place where um, there's a there's a stone and here's a tomb and it's exactly what everybody has in their imagination. Um, the historical evidence seems to say that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is actually the tomb but there's a church built on it, and there's all sorts of things going on that most American Protestants in plain church ways don't appreciate, but that's that's the actual site of the tomb of Christ. So I mean, these things just go both ways. And I'm going to finish playing this because I thought this was just a, a tremendous episode of The Rest is History. But it isn't as binary as it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's a, there's a greater understanding of 
these questions are hard to answer and the questions themselves aren't exactly don't exactly play the way they thought they sh they should or we should or they should and and I, I think about this because of course questions of historicity in the bible matter um to me the resurrection the physical resurrection of jesus christ matters um the the deliverance of israel from egypt matters now what that looked like that's really hard to say, partly because we don't know what a lot looked like. Because again, when you get into his questions of ancient history, you just have these little scraps. Um, questions surrounding the, um, the, the background of the LDS church in America matters. And part of why the LDS church is struggling is, well, that's, that's pretty recent and it's pretty available. And a lot of their backstory is a little fantastical, but we're... What's, what we're doing right now is we're not pre-modern, sort of this wildness that was sort of tamped down in the Protestant Reformation and the, and the Catholic reforms. Um, and we're, we're, we're trying to once again figure out, well, how can we sort of work out these questions of, of, of meaning, of, of history, and... In fact, I mean, so many of the mental pictures that the attacks via modernity brought against so many traditional things, now we see them as, well, you just sort of have this monarchical vision of way things should be. And in fact, even if you're looking at things that are far away from religious questions, Things didn't look at all like you imagined they would be in the picture of your mind. And in fact, the, the selection of the relevance of the particular items or another, that was a product of your desires too. On the other hand, I suppose the counter argument would be we in, in Britain have loads of historical sites that are... Bogus, you know, bogus, fabricated, that we we attribute with all kinds of meaning that's really not necessarily justified. I mean, I can't think of them. I can't pluck them well, off the shelf. I, but okay, but but I think I think actually the parallel isn't really with tourist sites. It's with pilgrimage sites. And, right. Yeah. You know, you can. You know, we've we've done the Kaaba. We've and in that we we talked about the the tomb of Christ, and or you think about um, tombs of saints or whatever. You were saying about Jerusalem, Tom. That you go to Jerusalem and people say, "Well, this is Calvary. This is this," and, and actually, it's custom and tradition that tells you it's this, rather than rigorous and the emotional investment, right? Because a place that that comes to have the emotional investment of its visitors it does, I think, come to take on a yeah, dare I say, sacral. No, you're absolutely right. You're um, right. Yeah. So I think the image of the door is powerful enough that it can survive the uh, the fact that it it isn't actually overtly what it says it is. I mean, yeah. I think it does still endure as a symbol. I think the other thing that's interesting about it is that it becomes a UNESCO heritage site the year before Auschwitz does, mm -hmm. and I suspect that lurking behind quite a lot of this is the way that um, sites to do with the Holocaust are starting to be packaged as places for tourists to visit. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a possibility. I think that, that one thing that is slightly awkward about this is that by emphasizing the slaves who were taken to North America and by tailoring the experience of visiting it to the people who can pay for it, in other words, Americans, one awkward question is, well, what about the slaves who were taken to, say, to Brazil? Or, yeah. See, and now you get all of the awkward layerings that we are increasingly um, familiar with. Yeah. The Caribbean. Who was by far the, I mean, the Brazilian element of the slave trade was the single biggest element, wasn't it? We've discussed that in previous episodes. Yeah. Um, and presumably they're not getting visitors from Brazil no. to uh, to the island of Gori. Well, there may be a few, but I, I, I don't think so. Not many. And I think also that it touches on issues that I think have become a lot more sensitive now than they were, say, in the 1990s. Because what's striking when you read the debate in the 1990s is actually, it's not how vituperative it is, but but relative to today, how measured it is. So yeah. there's indisputably, you know, there is a sense of resentment on the part of African scholars, of white American scholars kind of crashing in and... and now, it's interesting if you go to, again, Matt Ridley and Jordan Peterson's 
video where Matt Ridley talks about, well, I, I wanted to have a sense of exactly what happened at the end of the Ice Age. And he noted that in the 1990s, scholars could simply write about the end of the Ice Age. And today, uh, anybody that w wishes to address the Ice Age must address climate change and global warming. And that the, in there is a lesson about history that, um, you know, when you, when you listen to Jonathan Peugeot talk about, well, a physicist, well, it's a pattern seeing patterns. Historians are just as much people within history, looking back at history, doing collective relevance realization about what they imagine to be important. Laying down the law. Um, and I think there is also... Um, you know, there's 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 a sense in in um, academic departments in America that it is usually white historians who are kind of undermining these narratives. It tends to be white historians. But so, sorry, Tom. I was just going to jump in and say, and, and of course, Tom Holland had this problem when he wrote in the Shadow of the Sword, and and Muslims, you know, someone comes up to him and says, "Why don't you do this to your own religion?" didn't think I had one. Oh, but you do. There's been a colossal furore in the United States um, about this very issue with regard to a different site. Yeah. So this is Elmina Castle in Ghana, I think. Yeah. So this is exactly what I thought about when I started reading this. And I was reading about, you know, what, what happened in the 1990s and thinking, actually, it seems to have passed off quite, quite, <laughs> quite quietly. Because as you say, there's been this scandal uh, kind of explosion of debate and fury around exactly this issue this summer. Yeah. So the president of the American Historical Association, who was a man called James Sweet, a very distinguished historian, I think, he wrote an article in their sort of newsletter talking about what he saw as the dangers of present-mindedness in history, of sort of subjecting history to of making it purely a vehicle for contemporary politics. And he gives, in the course of the sort of buried in the article, he talks about how, you know, he's a his. Now, in some ways, I mean, Dominic and Tom are modern historians. And they, you know, we, we want to sort of, we want to sort of appropriate this monarchical vision and see things as they are. Well we have to see things the best we can and of course there there are there are questions of physical correspondence with descriptions that's that's all important and to the degree that we can access them good to get at but so often you have to do the best you can story i think of of, of africa and um, he and his family went to a wedding in Ghana and they went on a tour of this place called Elmina Castle. And he comments in the article, he says, you know, the, the weird thing about this place is that it's become, he describes it as, I mean, you talked about pilgrimages, Tom. He describes it as an African-American shrine. It's become more of an African-American shrine than a Ghanaian archaeological or historical site. And then he goes on to say, He's really troubled by this because he says less than 1% of the Africans who went through Elmina went to North America. The vast majority went, went to Brazil, Brazil. Yeah. or the Caribbean. But their stories are kind of erased and it's been turned into, I mean, he doesn't make this explicitly, but he basically is saying it's been turned into a kind of disnified tourist attraction for relatively affluent African Americans. Well, also that it's been retrofitted. Yeah. That the history has been retrofitted. Exactly. And the, the slaves taken to Brazil have been erased, basically. Now, the difference between the 1990s is he wrote this, um, and it's actually a very sober kind of piece. There was a massive furore, and he did that thing, which we've talked about a few times on the rest of history. He did this sort of post-cultural revolution groveling apology. And he said, um, "I have. I'm deeply sorry. I have. I've let everybody down. I should never have pointed this out. I've alienated my colleagues. I've done this, that, and the other. And it's actually. I mean, without us taking sides on this at all, because we're not specialists. You know, it's a very good example of how embittered this whole and how incredibly difficult this whole conversation has become. Yes, and I think also it lends weight to the idea that this is um, fundamentally about." It's, it's a place of, of almost religious pilgrimage. And the issues are basically kind of, you know, verging on the theological. I think that as 
uh, you know, the, the overt hold of kind of Christian doctrines that were so important to the civil rights movement have kind of faded from a uh, progressive wing of American politics. In a way, history has come to replace the Bible. It's come to replace um, the theological dimensions. To question received understandings of history has become akin to to questioning devoutly held beliefs about right. r- religion and God. Yeah. And you know, just as questioning the validity of a religious place of pilgrimage is incredibly sensitive, so likewise, it, it, it's evident that to question this is is similarly. Um, it upsets people very much because there, there there are two arguments. Wouldn't there? One would be to say, "You white Americans, or indeed Britons, or indeed white British podcasters." Right, right. As I was about to say, exactly that. White British podcasters or white American historians doesn't matter which have no business. You know, this is yet more colonialism, or something. Some people would say, sort of, a, some kind of intellectual colonialism. And the other counter argument, I suppose, would be, um, well, in a way, the literal truth whether or not millions of slaves pass through is less important than the metaphorical truth. Uh, the physical truth, and when he said the metaphorical truth, I thought, have you been listening to Brett Weinstein? That's what yeah. the defenders of this um, institution would say, wouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's pretty much what, uh, what, what Dion Brand is saying, I think. And what do you think, Tom? Well, I think that um, that, that, that is up to the individual pilgrim who goes there. I mean, I entirely see that if you're an African-American who wants some sense of contact with your ancestor and all the suffering and horror that was inflicted on those ancestors, and this door, this building, this island has come to be a focus for that, I don't think that the kind of statistical evidence for it actually matters one way or the other. I think it's perfectly possible, and I speak with some experience of this, to, to go to a place where you know that the history may be dubious, but because it's become endowed with particular understanding by generations of people who've gone there before you, the power of it is, you know, you can feel the power very intensely. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the difficulty is, you know, that's a legitimate response. But I do also think that, you know, a world of historical inquiry in which it is basically forbidden to ask questions about pretty basic historical facts is a troubled one, I think. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. That's exactly what I would say. So so if I go to the Imperial War Museum and I look at the little ship they have there, the Tamsin, the smallest of the little ships that uh, that carried people back from Dunkirk, which obviously stirs great feelings of patriotic excitement and all right-thinking Britons, you can go there and, and feel moved by it while well, simultaneously knowing <laughs> yeah. that most soldiers yeah. were not rescued by little ships and that had that little ship never gone, you know, the course of the war would be no different. And, and actually it's perfectly reasonable to have both those things in your head at once. That on the one hand, you're very moved by this sort of, this little metaphor, but on the other hand, you know as a scholar that the, as it, in inverted commas, the real history is, is very different. And I think the, the problem with this is if one yeah. crowds out the other. Well, I, I, I don't think that a myth, a myth isn't a dirty word, I don't think. No, agreed. And, and myths are deserving objects of historical study. And the way that they grow and the, the, the hold that they have, yeah. it's not for historians to patrol them and mock them and poo-poo them and say that they're not valid, because they are. But likewise, I, I don't think that you can... You know, and I kind of had experience of this writing about religion. Yeah. In a way, you have to acknowledge the power and the potency of religious myths, of religious teachings, or whatever, while simultaneously adopting a kind of skeptical attitude where there is room for skepticism. I also think you can't have a world in which James W. Sweet or whatever his name is, or or any of, or, or Philip Curtin, that they feel they can't talk about this by virtue of their whiteness well i think i think the thing that's interesting is that that curtin obviously never felt that whereas sweet obviously does <laughs> so uh and i think that that's a kind of reflection yeah. of, of maybe the the uh the, the the change of culture in in the united states i mean i have to say from my own point of view i was not expecting to arrive at this conclusion i mean i did i i did not know this when I when I set out, uh, and I think it's a really really interesting topic. I mean, the test, I suppose, to some extent, is if you were in Senegal, would you go? And of course, I would go. Wouldn't you? I would absolutely go. Yes, yes. And it wouldn't bother me that it was 
slightly confected, but I would want to know. I would want to know the truth as well as seeing the metaphor. But you're saying that as someone whose ancestor wasn't ever taken from no. the coast of Africa. So I think that the emotional complications of it are, are you know, are more complex for Agreed. people whose ancestors were taken from there. It's easier for a sceptic to sort of hurl out opinions from the outside, you know, someone who's not personally involved, than I guess it is for a pilgrim, to use your analogy, Tom. Yeah, in a very, very different way. Uh, I don't particularly like people casting doubt on the greatness of Alfred. Um, <laughs> For instance, you know, there are as, there are fields in history where we have emotional engagement equally. There is a kind of responsibility if you're a historian, if you're researching his, history, researching the past, that you have to deal with a certain, you know, where there's a certain bedrock of fact. Mm. I don't think that you can ignore it. Tom, it wouldn't be a rest is history podcast about the history of Senegal if you didn't find a way to bring it back to Alfred the Great. <laughs> and you have. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, it's an absolutely fascinating story because it raises... Interesting questions, not just about, I mean, in a weird way, this is not a story. It, it started out as a story about Senegal in, you know, the, the early modern period going up to the 18th century and then newly independent Senegal. But it's actually ended up being a podcast about the racial politics of America and about the nature of history and myth. So like all great rest is history podcasts, it's gone. We've, we've been on a journey, Tom. We have. Haven't we? we have. We've been on a journey and we'll be going on another journey tomorrow. So. And if you want to know one of the books that I'm reading now, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry, where he gets into, well, there's genetic, there's, um, there's genetic Adam, there's, and there's, um, there's Y chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve. But what's the difference between genetics and genealogy? And yeah, these, these, these questions don't go away. So when you get to someone like Douglas Murray and and well you know you know ask Esther who was on unbelievable with him well want to hear a voice okay what would that voice have to say truth is you have no idea what that voice would have to say because most for most of us most of these tests are nowhere near what we think they are now when it comes to Jordan and his Exodus seminar, well, again, for Jordan, the, to the best of our knowledge, because he's, he's, he's quite modernist in terms of, well, my personal views are personal, so, so, but out of them. Called Missing God, and the subtitle is Jordan Peterson and the Decline of Atheism. And what's really funny about this is I had dinner with Connie Selica and John Tesh a couple of weekends ago, and we had this a, a great a great dinner at this restaurant in Beverly Hills. And when we walked in and sat down, we noticed that right next to us in a booth right next to us was Jordan Peterson and his wife. And so we were like, "Whoa!" Because Connie and John are fans of Jordan Peterson, and so and I and I am too, and I've known about him for a long, long time. And so. After dinner, he he actually got up with his wife to leave and we kind of stopped him <laughs> and we're like, hey, we love you. We like we love your work. And we ended up in this conversation with him. And, uh, you know, it's funny because Connie asked him just bluntly, she said, you're a Christian, right? And he said his answer was was very revealing, which we'll get into in the episode. But um and then we, I told him, uh, well, actually Connie told him about my show and she said, you need to go on Beckett's show. And so he's like, what, what's your show? And I said, well, it's called the Beckett Cook Show. And I gave him my card and I had a moment with him and I told him basically a short version of my story and I invited him on my show. So we'll see. And, 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 and Beckett's got a book out there. If you want to hear his story, I, I bought his book so I could hear his story. It's on audiobook too. It's a very interesting story. He's a <laughs> he's a gay man who prayed the gay away in some ways. Um, I don't know if that's fair, but Bethel was Bethel was on Bethel was on his Bethel was on his show, and um, yeah, basically 
Jordan said, I'll let the cat out of the bag. You know, I don't, I don't answer that question. That's a private question. Are you a Christian? Well, it, it reminded me of, in my book, I talk about this. Uh, I talk about uh, Evelyn Waugh's novel, um, Brides Had Revisited, because- Which I love. Which I, I love, love yeah, novel. of course. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, re- I, I just wonder if Bethel paid him to mention Brides Had Revisited, because she mentions it all the time. Read his that novel Good like stuff. five times, and I watched the miniseries with uh, uh, Anthony Jeremy, Andrews and Jeremy Irons. Jeremy yes. Irons in the eighties. Yes. I watched that miniseries so many yep. times. Um, I don't know if I should do a British accent or not, but I, anyway, what the, the character? No, you do. You do a great British accent. I okay, the British character accent. Charles, Charles Wright, and this is what I feel like, where George kind of the the space that I that Jordan Peterson is in. He says. The view implicit in my education was that the basic narrative of Christianity had long been exposed as a myth, and that that and that opinion was now divided as to whether its ethical teaching was of present value, a decision in which the main weight went against it. Religion was a hobby, which some people professed and others did not. At best, it was slightly ornamental. At worst, it was one of the provinces of complexes and inhibitions, catchwords of the decade, and of the intolerance, hypocrisy, and sheer stupidity attributed attributed to it for centuries. No one had ever suggested to me that these quaint observances expressed a coherent philosophical system and intransigent historical claims, nor had they nor had they done so, would I have been much interested. Now, Charles Ryder is much more um He's much cynical. more cynical about it, yeah. but right, but that that kind of sums up a, in a way just the idea of well, does this have does Christianity does the Judeo Christian worldview have some benefit to society? And it seems like Jordan Peterson is is latching on to that in some way, right? And in a way, he's saying you know as long as it benefits society, that's really the that's really what matters. So, you know, if he encounters a Christian, he's going to say, great. And, and, and I'm, I, I think Bethel might be selling him a bit short here, actually. I think Jordan's um, a little further over the line than some of what Bethel says here. Hey, man, you know, you just good for you. More, he's not it's good for the world. So, exactly. Right? Uh, he when he's responding to Harris's question is, you know, do you believe in God or who is God? He says, God is how we, and this is, this is, again, this is kind of his word salad. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence of an action of consciousness across time. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. God, and then he goes on, okay. God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment, mercy, and guilt. God is the future to which we make sacrifices. What yes, do you I think mean, of all that? I feel like there's, there's good stuff in there. Right? <laughs> this is where I got my God number one and God number two. And again, I'm I'm less... I There's a clip that I actually... In, I was tempted to post it on Twitter from, from the third episode... Well, yes. look, you're going to know in action. Actually, well, yeah. well, you, that, that makes sense because the Bible is revelatory. And what that means is that what's being revealed is the nature of the spirit of God. And so with it's each progressive story, absolutely. Yeah, with each progressive so, so now you know story, you know more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and that just continues mm-hmm. with each. I mean, in, it's it's so true from a narrative sense that the Bible is a sequence of revelations of character. It's like, well, who's God? Well, first of all, he makes order out of chaos. And second, it's the order that's good. And then he he's the spirit you walk with when you're unselfconscious in the garden. And then he's that which prepares Noah to batten down the hatches. And now he calls you to adventure. And each of those is, oh, that's what God is. It's then that those things are really qualitatively different. And, and it's, it's even a miracle that you can, in some sense, see them as a unity, right? And say, oh, all those different things, those are the same thing. Well, what is that? Well, th- I guess that's what it is. That's where we get it here. Mm-hmm. All those things that have already been revealed are now shown to be a manifestation of 
the cardinal principle of being itself. Yeah. And that's, right. I mean, you see it because before that like God is constantly revealing himself with all these names, like all these different names, different aspects mm -hmm. of God. And then we get to this revelation of God as being itself or the ground of being itself. And I think that that, I think it's, it's, that's hinted at in the text also, because you see, you know, before that, it's like Abraham called upon God with this name and then he called upon God with this name. And so they have all these different names for something which is revealed like I'm not saying they didn't think it was the same, but right. I'm saying that, that in this, this revelation that Moses have, has, it's all, it all comes it all together. Comes th so that's around an hour and 55 minutes in the third episode. So, boy, there's a lot going on. And, and so what, what then, again, Peterson, Peterson comes at the Bible not with a narrative of, let's say, divine revelation with a picture of, oh, here's this, this very famous stell of Hammurabi's code where the God is giving it. For Jordan, God is has revealed it through history. And so there's something very very Jewish about that, but through in some ways Darwinian history. And and it is in fact revelation. And he sees the correspondence between the stuff that he sees in science and 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 that's in many ways how God how God reveals himself. Let's uh maybe I'll play this clip again. Attributes of well, yes. look. You're going to know in action. Well, well, in well you, that that makes sense because the Bible is revelatory, and what that means is that what's being revealed is the nature of the Spirit of God. And so, with it's each progressive story, absolutely, yeah, with yeah. each so, progressive so now you know story, you know more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and that just continues mm -hmm. with each. I mean, in, it's it's so true from a narrative sense that the Bible is a sequence of revelations of character. It's like, well, who's God? Well, first of all, he makes order out of chaos. And second, it's the order that's good. And then he, he's the spirit you walk with when you're unselfconscious in the garden. And then he's that which prepares Noah to batten down the hatches. And now he calls you to adventure. And each of those is, oh, that's what God is. It's then that those things are really qualitatively different. And, and, it's, it's even a miracle that you can, in some sense, see them as a unity, right? And say, oh, all those different things. Those are the same thing. Well, what is that? Well, th I guess that's what it is. That's where we get it here. All those things that have already been revealed are now shown to be a manifestation of the cardinal principle of being itself. All those things that have already been revealed are now shown to be a manifestation of the cardinal principle principle itself and then Peugeot will go into being and so again they're they're Peterson through his walk through the Bible is re-knitting it now is this Protestant well you could you could sort of make a case that it's it's Protestant in terms of the 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 focus on the Bible itself okay um is it is it rewilding? So does it have elements of the of the sacramental and the um, and the pre-modern? Yeah, in some ways it does. It's mythological. It's all of these things. And and now with you know this this group around the table at the um, at the as the sun sets on modernity, they're weaving again together the correspondences and approaching it in a new way and that's that's why again i think this stuff is important and we're unlike many times in period where well there's you hear you may might read an account of some seminar or something we're actually getting a chance to sort of watch all of this happen and um even though jordan if he wants to tell Connie Selleck and John Tesh, this is private, it's private. That's, but we're watching him work through the issues as he goes and to just kind of 
dismiss this away as, well, well, his his description of God doesn't meet my description of God. Oh, okay. Or as a skeptic, what I think Christians should think. Well, most Christians do. And, you know, again, I I am much more someone who comes from the traditional path. Okay, but Jordan is weaving this together with a little help from his friends. And all of these questions that we're wrestling with now at the end of modernity, we're wrestling with them. And that's why this is important. So, I, yeah, you know, my videos are odd. You know, these two, three long sections of citations and then just a little tidbit at the end. So um, I, I, I hope it's helpful. If uh, Just leave a comment. Let me know if it's helpful or not helpful. And I appreciate that.